Hello everyone, it is June 15th, 2020. My name is Tanushree and I am an adjunct CLT at LaGuardia Community College. Today I'm speaking with Thomas Haggerty, who is an adjunct professor of nursing at LaGuardia Community College and also a bedside nurse. Thank you so much for joining us today, Thomas. Thank you for having me. Uh, so what courses do you teach right now? I teach MedSurg 2, which is SCR 290. Okay. And how has that changed now that, you know, the pandemic has hit? Well, after the first week, uh, we had the week-long hiatus, and then uh, everything went to um, on Zoom online. Do you have courses in which you need to teach actually on site? Yeah, um, I have a, um, a desktop that has a touch screen, so I could write on the desktop. So actually, it, it was fine doing the lecture, but um, then um, there's four hour lecture on Thursday and then in the, there's afternoon labs on Wednesday and Thursday for three hours and they need to have practice doing hands on skills, which they didn't get, unfortunately. I'm from the industrial design department at LaGuardia, so we've had a very similar problem too. Um, you know, normally I would be in the wood shop with the students trying to show them physically how to make things and it's been really exactly. tough that way. Exactly. Sorry? Mm hmm Yeah. Um, so you have been on the front lines. I saw that you sent me a picture of yourself in scrubs with, I oh. assume, some, some students. <laughs> um, well, as a, as a nurse, I work in a critical care unit at Columbia Presbyterian. Well, it's called New York Presbyterian. Okay. And um, I, nurses, for the most part, work 12-hour shifts. So I only work three, three days a week. And that okay. gives me time that I can be an adjunct professor for two days. So, um, yes, I've been, my primary job really is as a nurse in the uh, neurological ICU. Okay. So when COVID happened, um, most of the, the critical care beds were converted to uh, bed ventilator. They, they were already ventilator ready, but they were converted to COVID patient rooms. So um, we had in the neuro ICU, I would say we have 18 beds and we had about 15 to, to 18 COVID patients for the, you know, from March, April, and May. And so the, the ICU had to kind of transform into a COVID unit as well? Yep, that's right. How has that affected your day to day? Well, um, we wear a lot more PPE. You can see on my face that I have like the mm -hmm. ring I'm wearing, the, the mask all day. And um, we wear a lot more, we wear double masks, the um, N95 and then the surgical mask all day, even amongst each other. Um, and we, in patient rooms, we are more pr protective. You know, we wear goggles and we wear, uh, a protective gown and gloves, of course. So that using a lot more personal protective equipment is cumbersome. And um, there's been, uh, we've had to do a lot of workarounds to create less exposure for staff to COVID. At the beginning, you know, people were um, unclear about what was protective. And so sometimes people would only wear droplet masks. Sometimes people would only the surgical masks. Sometimes, most, for most of the time, the nurses who had I work with and myself, we wore the N95 masks. But we were used to discarding masks after a single use, and then we had to we just would run out if we had to do that. And so we got into the habit of like prolonging the use of some of this stuff. Is that safe to do? Um, well, I'm still alive. So. <laughs> is, are there ways to actually sanitize those masks? Uh, supposedly, but I mean, I guess the first way is not to share it. Mm -hmm. And then if you have an N95 mask on and you wear it all the time, what you can do is, which is what I did, was take a surgical mask and put, which we all did, we put it over the N95 and then we would change this. Okay. The N95 masks were the ones that were mostly a short supply. Okay. I would change it. Some people didn't change it, but um, then I I kept my N95 uh, for a couple days. So I mean, really, we used to change them every 
every time we went into a patient's room, but that was because you don't have in normal times, you don't have as many patients who require using N95. It's really mm -hmm. just TB patients and some like maybe varicella or zoster patients, but you don't really have as many patients that needed N95. But um, so because of that ambiguity and because of the short supply, I was like, mm, I'm just gonna reuse mine. It's not visibly soiled and it's protected by the droplet mask, you know, and I'll change the droplet mask frequently. So my, I don't know, my, my N95, if it got visibly soiled, um, then I threw it out and I got another one. But I mean, usually they last, I mean, it's longer than, the manufacturer recommends eight hours at the most. So I mean, I'm, I'm well exceeding the manufacturer's mm -hmm. recommendation, but I don't think that I'm, I don't think that I'm in danger. I think it's okay. Well, we'll see. So I remember towards the beginning of the pandemic, there were a lot of news outlets talking about how there was a shortage of proper protective equipment or personal protective equipment, rather. Is that something that you experienced at Presbyterian? Uh, no, I think, you know, they're not maybe the top of the line stuff, mm -hmm. but we have had sufficient support especially if you you know do some shortcuts by like for instance pre-wearing you know it would only be we would have had a shortage if we followed the guidelines which are to change the n95 okay. every time but we okay. don't no, nobody's been doing that so yeah i see uh, so what are some of the concerns you had uh, as an educator at the beginning of the pandemic for your students and how have you combated that well, um, I switched over to the online lecture fairly mm -hmm. well, easily, and that was not a problem, I think. I think, you know, probably for future students, my, I think my questions, we gave our, I gave the exams over Blackboard, so I think those exam questions are probably fairly compromised at this point. <laughs> so, I mean, for future students, those were good test questions that got sacrificed if, if the current students you know, took some liberties with screen shares and so forth for the future. And I know, you know, there's a certain amount of, there's a certain amount of exam question sharing that goes on, but I think it was facilitated by COVID and taking exams at home. So, I mean, that's going to be problematic for future students because rather, rather than prepare for exams, they're probably just prepared by getting hold of the answers and that doesn't really serve them when it comes to the t when it comes time for them to have to pass the licensure exam yeah but um and then of course a lot of students did not have uh a good internet connection a lot of students you know had challenges with technology i'm not the most technological savvy but i think it's sometimes a myth that young people are too. So a lot of the people in my class maybe didn't understand sometimes mm -hmm. how to work technology and, 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 and sometimes some of the technology that we have is a little clunky. You know, Blackboard is a little clunky sometimes. Yeah. That wasn't really good. That was a bit of a challenge too. But I think I wouldn't mind doing the lecture online for the rest of my career at LaGuardia. I didn't mind it. And I have kind of a high-end desktop, so it, it allowed me to do touch screen. It allowed me to share screen quickly and so forth. Yeah, so it's more of the hands-on stuff where you feel like the learning well, is... Well, yes, that's the, that was the big deficit. Not just hands-on, but nursing students mm -hmm. have to go to sites and they have instructors in the site, you know. So I have 40-something students, and then I had, uh, in the lab, I had... 10 at a time and I had two other professors with me in the lab but the lab portion is only three hours whereas they have clinical portions for the rest of the week so they have to go to healthcare facilities 10 at a time with a, a clinical professor who works in that facility and um, uh, you know they, they're an adjunct who works for LaGuardia but they bring the students to the facility and many times they are they work there as well as nurses too like I do and so the facilities didn't allow them to come because 
you know, they didn't want a risk of the students getting infected, but also they didn't have sufficient PPE for students to wear. And um, so my students were really deprived of some valuable clinical time. Yeah. Do you think that this is something that is going to affect their ability to graduate on time? No, they all graduated. Well, not all of them. Okay. But uh, it, it, I think that the state allowed um, alternative clinical settings for this. So they did a lot of stuff online with their adjunct, with their clinical instructor. Okay. So the state allowed them to complete their clinical hours this semester because of COVID. Okay, I see. That's good. Were there any concerns that they expressed to you about all of these big changes? How have they been? Um, well, they didn't express to me about their clinical professors. Uh-huh. But um, to me, you know, a lot of them had trouble sometimes uh, with, the, with, with um, kind of unreliable internet connections. Mm -hmm. And my connection isn't great either. So I had to like take a cable and every, for the lecture and run it to the router because the Wi-Fi connection wasn't, it was sufficient for, you know, what I was doing grade wise and going on blackboard but it wasn't enough for 40 students to have a okay. zoom like so they expressed concern about that so i did a quick fix for that okay what about outside of education in um their personal lives or anything how COVID one student been had covid one student's father died of covid oh. one student had a baby in the hospital so you know they had struggles that way too one student, a couple students, you know, felt like they had to self-isolate from their families. So that made, you know, that made an added burden. It's already a burden for family members of nursing students because, you know, they, the nursing students are really hyper-focused on the class and passing. So, you know, it's already burdensome for their families who have to kind of pick up some of the slack during the semester. And then if, you know, there were some who felt like, they were high risk because of exposures. Most of the students work in healthcare already, mm -hmm. you know, in like some sort of supportive role. And so they had to isolate themselves. And so. Yeah, that, that's really scary. How do you contend with going into work knowing that you're potentially exposing yourself and anyone that you might be living with? Um, well, I... I mean, I do wear the personal protective equipment mm -hmm. and when I get home, I, I change and take a shower right away. And I live, I just live with another adult. So okay. he's in healthcare too. So it's, you know, we, we don't have kids or anything like that. Yeah. So I make sure to practice good standards of isolation with yeah. patients, a lot of hand washing and then. I didn't used to take a shower after work. I know a lot of nurses do, but I didn't used to, but now I do every time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, obviously. Work too, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I think that's the best you can do in this case anyway. And I keep my uniforms kind of separated and in the corner. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they're not, I don't think there's a way that they would be contaminated, but. Yeah. What is something about working in the front line that you think people don't know about? Well, there's a lot I think mm -hmm. that people don't know about. You don't have to just pick one. <laughs> I think that, all right, for, I think that maybe New York State, I think, was not as prepared as we could have been. Okay. Because, because they did hire eventually as we, as like, you know, a hospital... A hospital room is not an equivalent, like a critical care room is very different from a med surge room. And, and, um, and so the governor, I think, maybe didn't understand that and thought a nurse is a nurse and a hospital room is a hospital room. But, uh, you know, not all hospital rooms can set, are set up to provide ventilator support. And not all nurses are critically care trained. You know, when I, when, what I teach is med sur medical surgical, which is sort of standard majority nursing, you know, but a minority of beds in a hospital are, are intensive care level where they can have a ventilator and they can have some advanced procedures that take place within the room. But the majority of beds and the majority of nurses are not 
critical care nurses. But it seemed like maybe the governor didn't understand that and demanded that, you know, the hospitals double their critical care capacity like it was an easy request. And it okay. was not it was not easy to do that. And, you know, uh, we, ha we did hire eventually some travel nurses at my hospital who had been at other hospitals and they portrayed, you know, some situations where the, the state and the hospital were a lot better prepared than New York was. So I know people are really loving the, the governor right now and his daily news conferences, but I don't know if, I don't know if it was quite as easy as he made it sound. I think you bring up a really important point that, you know, he doesn't necessarily know what it's like himself to be a frontline coworker. Um, no, maybe no one does. And, and like I always, and, and he would say, we've got to get 10 ventilators. We've got to get a hundred ventilators. We've got 15 ventilators from this place and that place. But the fact is only a handful of people know how to run a ventilator. Mm -hmm. Only a critical care nurse or a respiratory therapist, or obviously an anesthesiologist know how to run a ventilator. The, mo for the majority of nurses and doctors do not know how to run a ventilator. So you can get all the ventilators you want. You know what I mean? If you don't know how to run one and you don't know how to take care of a patient who, is, who has mechanical ventilation, then those ventilators are no good. But the pro so they kind of stretched, they kind of stretched the people who did know that stuff. Mm -hmm. they, they stretched us a little too much you know, past the point where I think it was safe for patients. Okay. I was speaking with an emergency medicine physician not too long ago, and uh, people were donating ventilators left and right. And she was like, we don't even have space to put these ventilators anywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. That's another thing I think that he, you know, probably didn't take into account. No, yeah, because you need, you need the, the um, mechanical air and you need an oxygen uh, that is built into the wall to come out to have connections to hook up to a ventilator. I mean, ventilators deliver, I mean, a lot of air, medical air, and, and they deliver a lot of, you know, oxygen. Air and oxygen are not the same thing. So, and they have specific outlets in the wall that are designed to do that, but it's not, it's kind of like it's kind of like the difference between an electric socket that you plug your air conditioner or your dryer into versus an electric socket that you plug a light or a fan into. They're different. So, you know, not, not all rooms have compatible compatibility for ventilators. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. That's a very, right. that's a very good. And that's idea. What, I think that's maybe what maybe the physician meant too, that it's, there's no place to put these. Yeah. Did you have any like um, thoughts about potential alternative solutions? Well, there was a, on social media, there was a lot of talk about putting one person on, putting more than one person on a one on a vent, but that's not feasible. And okay. I mean, I don't think that was done where I work. I don't think it could be done, but um, I think that was a social media kind of hoax. Okay. But um What they did do was um, we had, th on my unit, we, out of 18 beds, we had three beds that can produce, that can provide reverse airborne precautions, meaning um, the room has vents set up that, that filter and vent the air to the outside atmosphere, and they filter the entire room four times an hour. And they did set up portable versions of those. And um, in, uh, in some of the other rooms, maybe 15% maybe 50% of the rooms on my unit that didn't have that already. I mean, they could continue to convert all the rooms that way. Doesn't, you know what I mean? To be, to vent air out, filter and vent air out. Um, but, you know, as the, as COVID kind of let up or, I mean, not just as COVID let up, but as during the, height of it, we were so full that there was no time a bed was empty that a person could, that the, the team that converted the rooms could go in and, and flip them over to, you know, to, to install the, the temporary machinery. But some of our rooms still have that. They could, they could continue to convert. So maybe if there's another surge or if, you know, 
so there were more, that's a, you know, it's safer to have a patient in that kind of reverse isolation room. Yeah, you mentioned social media. Were there any other trending posts going around that were kind of inaccurately depicting what was going on? There was a woman who said she was a nurse practitioner who said she had a friend at Elmhurst Hospital. And um, so this woman who said she was a nurse practitioner was saying how all sorts of shenanigans were taking place at Elmhurst Hospital. And and she painted a very grim and picture. And then there was a lot of backlash from people that worked at Elmhurst saying that's not what's happening, et cetera. And I didn't watch the video because it was more than five minutes. <laughs> so I didn't watch it, but I was, but that was, that happened. And so a lot of people were very upset about it. And, you know, I follow the union, I'm in the nurses union. So I follow them on Facebook and someone posted the video onto the Facebook page of the union. And, um, a lot of people commented about it. I didn't really get into it. Maybe. Ooh, okay. okay. Another thing that happened on social media at my hospital was the president of the hospital would give these daily addresses. And she, at one point, I don't know why she would do this, but at one point she said in her daily address, people have been emailing me, not me personally, she's mm-hmm. saying that people have been emailing me saying that they don't feel supported and they feel scared and they don't feel that we're doing enough. And, uh, and then she went to say something, and I'm you know, paraphrasing, but she said, and if you don't like it, you don't have to work here. <laughs> oh, that also was posted on social media and then the union page. And, and um, it seemed a little tone deaf at the time because people were very scared. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what do you think of the situation now? There's a lot of reports saying that there is going to be a resurgence in a few months. Um, well, I mean, I know that just this morning, the, the governor was kind of upset with people up in the Upper West Side going out to bars and not social distancing and not, you know, and that happened over Memorial Day to... And it happened, you know, it's happening currently during the Black Lives Matter protests. So I think we just have to wait and see if something happens. I don't know. I'm not an epidemiologist. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I, I personally wonder if it's going to be as bad because, because for the most part, people are all freaked out about it now, I think. So... There's no movies, there's no weddings, there's no funerals, there's no Broadway, there's no mass gatherings. There's barely like churches and and so forth and synagogues and mosques so that, you know, maybe despite these little, these incidents of, you know, yuppies drinking on the Upper West Side or mm-hmm. people protesting, you know, maybe despite that, there's still not the group events that we once had I don't I don't do any group events you know and I always wear a mask on the subway and out when I go outside so and I don't go you know if I don't have to I don't go shopping you can't go shopping or in stores or in in closed places so I think that's kind of still the case that people maybe are a little bit gun shy about that so I don't know if there's going to be the resurgence. Okay. Yeah, it's illegal to walk into any or even walk around in New York State now without a mask. So I think people are... People are still doing it, but... <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think it's very well enforced, but <laughs> um, I do think people are taking it more seriously. I think you're right about that. Well, maybe, but maybe also just the amount of closures um, of general big things will also... Slow, have will also slow a, a resurgence. Yeah, because, everything is uh, is closed. Um, they're limiting how many people are allowed in a grocery store at the same time. You know, in that there was nothing like that during the initial big surge. Yeah. So maybe that will be blunt. That will blunt the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> we're hopeful that 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 that's the case. If it does come back, that it's not too bad. Fingers crossed. Yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, thank you so much for doing this interview with me. If there are any closing thoughts, anything that I didn't ask you that you wanted to add? I mean, I'm very proud of how my nursing students did. Mm-hmm. You know, they persevered. 
And, you know, a lot of them, like I said, were working too. So they were, we were under the stress of school and under the stress of a stressful situation at work. So, I mean, I think, you know, the students really did a fantastic job of, of uh, toughing it out. That's great. I can speak to that too. Uh, I think the students in industrial design have really been just making the most of it and they've been doing doing the best with what they can do. I think all you can really do is just control what you can control. It's an important lesson for all of us, I think. Thank you very much for, for recording this with me. All right. Nice to talk to you. Yeah, you too. Have a great day. Bye.